and welcome to another episode of From No Crypto to No Crypto. This is the Crypto Coach, Blockchain Wayne, with another cryptocurrency podcast. Today's episode brought, brought to us by Blockchain Training Academy, helping take blockchain and cryptocurrency education to the masses. Today's episode is a, li- a recording from a live stream I did with Bilal Mia, who's the Crypto Vader. We did it in our Facebook group talking about the halving, which is coming up real soon, depending on when you listen to this podcast. It may have already happened. But listen in to learn a little bit more about that. And then we just start to talk about all things crypto and blockchain uh, to give you some insight into that. So go ahead and have a listen. What is up, everybody? So, yeah, I guess we were live, but at the time, the LinkedIn thing quit uh, quit, quit working. So I guess that beta test isn't working right. Um, so what's up, everybody? This is uh, this is our halving talk, right? Let's talk halving. Uh, myself, Blockchain Wayne. We've got Bilal Mia, the crypto vader with us just to talk halving so a lot of people are wondering what is the halving what does that even really mean and how does that affect your everyday person that maybe is invested in crypto um i know you got a little bit more experience in the crypto space than i have you've been through what at least a couple of the halvings or have you been through all three no i've uh, my, my, the one i because I, I got in involved in 2013 so i missed the right that. that one so uh my first one was 2016. So this is my second one as well. So, um, all right, yeah. Seems like the other day. To be honest, it's like four years gone by. So much has happened in four years. So yeah, crazy. A lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of growth, right? <laughs> definitely, definitely. I I remember being at work and uh, you know just looking at my portfolio and uh, you know thinking that sixteen bitcoins is not enough. I was <laughs> like, you know, that's not enough to buy a house. And it was like, at that time, it was, I think it was around $400, $500. I think the halving took it up to about $500, um, a Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, man, I was like, you know, 16 Bitcoin. And that's the thing. It's like, even now, uh, looking at a Bitcoin, just a bit less than 10 grand. We're thinking it's like, it's not doing well. It needs to be over 10 grand. But just wait a few years and look back at this time and you think wow that was a bargain why did not take action yeah absolutely 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 so um you know there's a lot of talk around what's going to happen with the halving what is it going to do and that's kind of what we want to discuss today because um you know there is and i'm going to share my screen in a second just to show you all something, sorry, it just popped up, but just to show you the history of the halving. But I think we got to use, you know, you've heard that disclaimer before. Um, past performance does not dictate current uh, future results, right? Um, so let's let me share my screen real quick, just to show you kind of what's happened in the past. And uh, this is a screenshot of what's happened since inception, since the halving. You notice the shaded area that's a little bit beige. That's kind of that's 365 days before the halving. So leading up and then after. So you look at the first one, uh, extremely huge gains after. And then you look at the one that happened in 2016, leading up to 2016. And then afterwards, it was still a steady climb. So we, I, I don't say we, I, I think we don't have enough performance to really dictate what's going to happen. What do you think, Bilal? Yeah, I think it's a different situation altogether this time because of obviously since the last halving, there was so much happening with the uh, the ICO craze, and then we had the institutional investors coming in, and you know so much has happened in the last four years, and now we've got this uh, pandemic and the global recession, and, and I think it's just going to get worse. But um, with with the the current situation, um, people are going to start to try to get into normality but it'll be a new norm and it's just about understanding that you know the the price of bitcoin i think the the thing about it is that we we focus on the dollar value of bitcoin you know and we got to detach ourselves from the dollar value and just look at bitcoin as bitcoin you know that's what i've been saying for the last few years you know just look at the fact that this bitcoin is it should be measured by what it can do, you know, 
decentralization and and when it comes to the issue of mass adoption it's about education it comes back to people understanding the difference between fiat currency and the problems with inflationary currency like what you could buy 30 40 years ago with a, a, the same amount of money you can't buy that anymore you know it's it's like you you basically have to spend a lot more so saving money doesn't really work in that way but when it comes to bitcoin you stock away your Bitcoin, it can be used as a store of value. But the problem is people need to understand what what it can do. And this halving right now, I think it's going to be more and more difficult for people to own a whole Bitcoin as we go forward. I think uh, you must have heard like, you know, there will be uh, if you put 500 people together, there'll be, uh, you know, out of that 500, there'll be a very few people that could even say that they have uh, 0.2 Bitcoin, you know, and I think when we have the next halving, it will be definite that, you know, there'll be a very small amount of, uh, you know, people that would be uh, able to say that they have ownership of a whole Bitcoin. That's a scarcity, you know, and I think this, this is, you know, we, we're, we've been lucky to witness the last four years um, of growth. And the next four years, I think we've got a lot of things to look forward to in tech innovation. But we need to also detach ourselves, not only with the fiat currency, but also from the fact that Bitcoin is the only uh, cryptocurrency. You know, we have to look at others mm -hmm. and what they can do because we have so much opportunity with other cryptocurrencies that can do what Bitcoin can do. But, you know, it's an improvement upon Bitcoin, like Chainlink, for example, you know. Um, some of these that are out there right now at three dollars chain link, we're not valuing it because it's three dollars. Again, we're looking at the dollar value, but we're not looking at what what chain link is about, you know. And that's again goes back to education. So it's all about educating the masses. But I think this this next four years is going to be the four years to be excited about. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when you when you talk about that, I think. So much in the media and marketing plays into the dollar value that that's what we think about. Mm. But there are billions of people around the world that have no access to financial institutions that with cryptocurrency can have access. Uh, basically, banking the unbanked is what, what we hear a lot about. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. But these marketers, you know, you think about people, all, you know, media always sharing the Bitcoin price when it's either going up or going down, depending, you know, their narrative de depends on which way it's going at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you have marketers like, you know, uh, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but there's some that, that, that flat have these flashy titles of five coins to $5 million mm -hmm. and it plays on people's um, emotions and they want to get rich quick and so it's not about get rich quick. It's about an alternative solution that solves a problem. So you're right with education, because one thing that you and I both teach when we get into education is to understand cryptocurrency, you got to go back to the current system and the problems. And then people understand why is there even a need for cryptocurrency? Mm. Um, but uh, you mentioned something about scarcity. So just, just to kind of talk about that um, when it comes to people that, may think, well, if it's scarcity, then, you know, if it's scarce later on, then people aren't going to, there's not going to be enough to go around. So can you explain to, to everybody like what, when scarcity happens and the value goes up, Bitcoin say maybe goes up to a much higher level. Why does that not matter? You know, I'm talking about like, you know, as far as with uh, Satoshi's and, and the divisibility of Bitcoin. Yeah, so, I mean, the supply is obviously 21 million. We know that. So that's like the maximum supply. And it's, I think, 2140, the year 2140, by the time all Bitcoins will be out there in, in the, you know, um, in circulation. So that mining process is taking place. You've got the miners who are verifying the blocks of transactions. They're getting a fee for mining the blocks. They're also basically getting a reward. And that incentive is Bitcoin. So as we go forward with this, Harvin, what's happening is the, the the amount of Bitcoin they get per block um, is being halved. So, you know, obviously, when I was mining Bitcoin at the, this spot right here where I'm sitting right now, I had an ASIC machine and I was mining Bitcoin. At that time, you know, it was a lot easier to mine like 
you know, Bitcoin and get some rewards. If you had an ASIC machine sitting at home, you could still do it, you know. And obviously, the earlier adopters were doing with graphics side, and the earlier um, adopters to them were doing it with CPU. But as it gets more difficult, it, it, you have to have these more powerful machines to mine because the amount of power you need to actually make it profitable, you know, it's, it's, it just doesn't make sense anymore. So you've got these big mi mining companies now that are mining, but it goes back to like what what are they actually getting per block? And it's going from, um, you know, you're, you're basically, when I when I was mining, it went from 25 to 12.25, and now it's going to be reduced again to 6.25. Um, is it? 6.25? Yeah, 6. Yeah, it went, yeah, it went to 12.5. Yeah, 12.5 and now 6.25. So it's been halved. So per block, you're getting 6.25 Bitcoin. And still, it seems like a lot to us. But when you're having to use so much power to, to mine the blocks, and you, you have to remember that a lot of these are part of a mining pool. So they're sharing the reward out. So per block, when they get that, it's not like if, you, you know, it's very difficult for you to actually mine a whole block yourself. Um, the chances of that gets gets re reduced dramatically. So the, what they do is they join these pools and they would, the computation power would be kind of, you know, you know they'd work, work together on one block to mine that block of transactions. So then that would be shared out depending on how much power they've used. So when it gets reduced, you're basically reducing the amount of rewards. But when it comes to, looking at the 21 million that will be mined over the next, um, well, it's 2120 now when we're looking at 2140. But as time goes on, it will be more and more difficult to mine Bitcoin. And also the amount of Bitcoin coming into circulation will be reduced. So those people who are holding Bitcoin, like a whole Bitcoin, um, you know, it, it will be more valuable in that in that sense as long as there is a demand and the demand has to come from the usability of it, the, the reasons why people would use Bitcoin. And as we have a younger generation coming and starting to use the technology in, in the way, you know, basically my kids, you know, a four year old, a nine year old, they know about Bitcoin, they understand blockchain. And that's the new generation, you know, just the way they're growing up with iPads and all this. And we didn't, it's, it's a new, um, generation that's growing up and they're going to be used to using cryptocurrencies so this 21 million bitcoin and the amount of around 18 million in circulation there's not a lot to be mined and as people start hoarding bitcoin and a lot of these institutional investors i think they're going to be manipulating bitcoin and also hoarding it away that that's speculation right but there has to be some kind of use and i think for bitcoin it's more about a store of value for, for people to use Bitcoin. They have to understand that you don't have to have a whole Bitcoin, you know, you can use Satoshis. So, you know, if you want to actually pay for something um, in Satoshis, um, you can, you know, and that's like a fraction of a Bitcoin. So you don't have to own a whole Bitcoin. And I, th I personally think that Bitcoin as a whole, like um, will be used for, bigger transactions like buying a house uh buying property um but the only way it's going to change is if the transaction fees are reduced if it gets a lot easier and dApps decentralized applications you know they they will make it easier for that kind of thing to happen but people need to understand why and there has to be a reason why you would switch from fiat to crypto and obviously with this pandemic already people are kind of thinking cashless already people are thinking um you know contactless payments so the next step i i would say is central bank digital currencies are going to come in and people are going to get curious about bitcoin um but by the time the masses understand bitcoin i think it will be um it won't be affordable for a lot of people to buy a whole bitcoin uh because of the scarcity and um the supply um getting limited i think people will look at satoshis and i think you'll hear more people talking about satoshi rather than bitcoin as in yeah. how many how many satoshis you've got you get yeah. is it, that that will be the new norm people will be more aware of satoshi by the time it gets to the masses i think it'll be satoshi and then you know that that's what we'll be talking about more and bitcoin will hit the history books i feel
Yeah, I agree. And you mentioned, uh, you know, using it for large transactions to buy a house. I mean, we've seen millions moved across uh, in the blockchain explorer of mm -hmm. millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And it's basically it, it's the most secure network out there to move anything. And when you get to there, some people may say for microtransactions, it's too expensive right now. And there could be technologies that will change that. But at the same time, you know, uh, those large transactions to move a few million dollars in a traditional financial institution would cost you tens of thousands of dollars. Of and on the blockchain, it only costs you a few dollars worth of Bitcoin. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's more secure, I feel, than any kind of uh, financial institution that can move it. So um, back to the halving, man, we're, um, you know, we're coming up on that. We talked about the halving rewards, how it went from um, 50 per block to the mining reward to 25 to 12.5. And in about a day and 10 to eight hours, I guess you could say, uh, it's going to be, be cut to 6.25, which you mentioned earlier. Um, you know, and so I was looking up earlier just to see exactly, you know, it's, it's roughly every four years. And some people may say, hey, why can't we pinpoint the exact time when the halving is going to happen? Because it's based on average block time. Now, the average block time is around 10 minutes, but uh, it, it varies. But it's every 210,000 blocks. And I was thinking about this today. It hit me for the first time. 21 million Bitcoin. Every 210,000 blocks, there's a halving of the rewards. Mm. Well, did Satoshi have a, is there some kind of hidden message with the number 21, right? You know, you think about 21 million, 210,000 blocks. Or did, was, I guess, was there any logic behind that? This is kind of just a guess, but uh, it hit me earlier. I was like, wait, what, is there something more we should look at with the number 21? Hmm. I don't know. I, 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 don't, I haven't come across anything. I mean, it's like 21 million. I've, I, I can't relate to anything else. Um, 21 million, then you've got the 2140, uh, the uh, when it, the whole supply is going, and then you've got 20. 2100 block, uh, sorry, 210,000 blocks. Yes, there is kind of that 21. Maybe it's his favorite number. I don't know. Well, maybe there's something special, but we don't know who Satoshi is, so it's hard to kind of say, isn't it? Really, yeah. to be honest, it could be. Yeah. I'm just um, wondering, you know, there were some cryptic, cryptic messages. I mean, the Genesis block uh, uses a headline about the uh, the bank bailout, right? So yeah. just wondering if there's any kind of hidden message with the number uh, 21. Um, and kind of go from there. So we've got uh, we've got one of our first questions, and this is uh, Bill from the BTA community. Bill says, um, "Let's see if I can read it." It says, "Do you think we will see the full potential of blockchain in our lifetime?" And then he says, "Also, this may be a rookie question. Do you think the price of BTC will ever stabilize and therefore earn the trust necessary for mass adoption?" Mm. I think there's a range, isn't there? It's like state stability of Bitcoin would be in a range. Like for the last year or so, we could say that the last three years, we could say it's kind of stable between 5K and 10K. You know, that's a range, isn't it? It's like you can't say st stability is like a specific price, but there would have to be a range. And um, that stability would be people would be used to spending, I mean, Right now, a lot of us are comfortable spending a few grand if we want to buy Bitcoin. Go back four years, you wouldn't be comfortable spending four or five grand on Bitcoin because Bitcoin was in the hundreds. So our whole mindset, the way we see Bitcoin is changing. So the next four years, it will be in the hundreds of thousands. If it is, we don't know. But if it is, then you'll be comfortable with that. You'll be comfortable spending 40 grand on less than a bitcoin to get me to to invest so then again it will be that range of stability between you know 20 grand and 40 grand that this is what yeah. bitcoin's price is at for the next four or five years so during that time period you'll be comfortable buying bitcoin between 20 grand and 40 grand so with that stability of that range and a massive drop would be below 20 grand or a peak would be like you know something like ridiculous that you know there's gonna be a correction would be above 40 grand if it goes to 60 grand you'd be thinking 
well, there must be a correction. This is like crazy, 60 grand, you know, it will correct to 50 grand, you know, but you will have that range. And I think that stability would be that range. Um, how about yourself? What do you think? Well, I mean, stability is relative. Mm. We, you know, in, in, in where you are in the UK and where I am in the US, stability is based on we're used to seeing a standard range of pricing. Now, we're, we're experiencing inflation every day. And I'd, I'd beg to say that we're going to experience some sort of hyperinflation soon with the amount of printing that's happening in each country's fiat currency. But think about stability. Bitcoin has been sta a stable vehicle for people in Venezuela, for people in Zimbabwe, and for people in other countries where their governments had also abused the financial institutions, but there wasn't, they didn't have a lot of structure. And so now, I mean, stable, if, if I'm selling an item, right, this Bitcoin, uh, desk logo and i'm selling this and i set this price at a thousand satoshis no matter what the price is then that's stable to me uh so stability is relative to the use so the more we use it i think we're going to see more stability in prices of it uh but we still got a long way to go there's still uh, a lot of hurdles just like you know you met Bilal mentioned earlier about um decentralized apps to make it easier. You think about when email first came out, email was clunky and hard to use and only coders could use it. And it would take days to send an email, but technology has been built on top of that system, you know, and improved on to the point where now a grandmother can send an email with the swipe of a finger on an iPad. And when we make transacting that easy, then that's, what's going to happen. Um, you know, so that's when we're going to see, a lot more use, a lot more stability, and people aren't going to fluctuate back between the dollar price or the euro price or whatever whatever currency you're comparing it to. So it's only relative um, because we call you know we call yeah. a, a coin pegged to the U.S. dollar a stable coin, but the U.S. dollar is constantly inflating, and the and and we're seeing the buying power of that constantly going down. So how stable is that? Yeah. You know. And uh, it depends on what you peg it to. I mean, I think, you know, with with Bitcoin itself, you have, like you say, you know, stability from use cases and people understanding that it can actually be used for various things. And that value will come from different use cases and that confidence, that trust, and that will give it stability. You know, it, right now we're in a, in, a, in a phase where we're going through speculation of how much Bitcoin is going to be worth um but not how is bitcoin going to be used you know and we have to have that shift and i think that's going to bring the stability what was the other part of the question um, oh it was about uh do we think we'll see the full potential of blockchain in our lifetime i think so it depends on if we how long how long we live but you know i think we will in the next in this decade i think we will start seeing probably the later half of the decade we'll start seeing more um use use of blockchain um but i think this recession period that we're going to go through and we're kind of coming into right now is going to start this whole um boom of technology just like we had the internet boom in the in the early 2000s um i think the next decade is going to be similar to that where we see a tech boom in blockchain um not only blockchain but ai vr uh, i think we'll, we'll be spending a lot more time in virtual reality um very we're very early you know but tech technology moves very fast it doesn't take time once once you have like certain hurdles crossed like microchips getting really really small and stuff you once you have these hurdles crossed it, it moves really fast yeah um, it's like a catalyst to where it just explodes exactly um, like yeah you know, you Let's, uh, let me switch on over let me share a screen so we can see the halving countdown I uh, wanted to share a couple of different halving sites. What's funny is each site here on the halving has a different time frame. So I wanted to cover this while we had time. I didn't mean to switch subjects so fast, but I really wanted to share this um, because we talked about block time. So this is Blockchair. Blockchair is a blockchain explorer to where you can search transactions uh, on multiple different blockchains. And so it shows, well, let me hit refresh. I guess I should hit refresh on each one, right? Because it kind of, uh, there's some lag. Um, so this one shows one day, nine hours, 40 minutes. And then I go to CoinMarketCap's one. 
and it shows one day, nine hours, 59 minutes. Not not too far away. Earlier, there was a big discrepancy, but as we get closer, you're going to see them move closer together. Um, this one is called Bitcoin Block Half. A lot of people are sharing screenshots of this one. Uh, you know, one day, nine hours, 49 minutes. And then we've got Binance has one. Binance is the weirdest one of all because they've got it ahead of time. They got it at one day, eight hours and 20 minutes. Big discrepancy there. Yeah. CoinGecko is another one. I got to hit refresh on each one because it hadn't updated since I uh, took it off the screen. So one day, nine hours, 39 minutes. So a lot of them are close. And then the halvening.com. This one's probably the uh, most cartoonish, funniest looking one. Uh, it's got, uh, wait for it to refresh, but it's got your rocket ship. It says halving number three. And you see one day, nine hours, 49 minutes. So, um, you know, that, that that's just some different sites. If you want to follow uh, the information, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm done, when we're done with this broadcast, I will put in the comments the links for each one of those. So you can check out and see which one you think is is actually going to be uh, going to be legit. So, um, all right. So uh, let's let's talk. Let's talk now, Bilal. What do you think? So obviously you, you mentioned mining pools earlier and there's a lot of yeah. uh, mining pools out there and, and a lot of them are based in China, but they're not the, a lot of the, what I'm finding is a lot of the countries that are in or that have, have businesses in those mining pools, they're physically located somewhere else, but their machines are in China as part of the pool because of the industrial sector, electricity. Uh, but what do you think is going to happen to the hash rate? And, you know, hash rate for these, I don't know, hash rate is the amount of, computing power being put into securing the, the Bitcoin uh, network, the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain. But what do you think is going to happen to the hash rate? Do you think it's going to go up or it's going to go down? And let's kind of talk about that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I think with, with the hash rate, you have, it depends on the computers that you use as well. I mean, what do you think you've got, you've got these machines and, you know, they're, kind of going out of date all the time and they're having to upgrade it, you know, all these miners having to upgrade their machines. But as tech, it's, it's going to be a tech war very soon where all these countries are going to realize that, hang on a minute, we're having to start from rock bottom again. And what is the next, in what is the new industries that we're going to have to get into, you know? Because a lot of industries are going to die out because of this pandemic and the recession and everything else that's coming. So you have the, the, all this money that's going to be printed and then you've got all this t t tech innovation and uh, everything that's going on. But certain countries like India, I think it's uh, the Indian subcontinent, African subcontinent, you know, they're going to start tapping into mining, I feel. You know, I think we have a few years to go yet, but when you start focusing on mining as a business, as an, as an industry, then the machines, the innovation and everything else, it's going to have an impact on the hash rate, the power. And we have to think about how we can make it more eco-friendly as well. You know, it, you know, to actually put in so much electricity into mining Bitcoin, what is the alternative to like, you know, look at proof of work, proof of stake? You know, there's other ways of mining Bitcoin and proving that these transactions have taken place. So... To me, it's like I, I just feel that there is going to be a lot of change in the way we mine, um, not just with Bitcoin, but other other um, cryptocurrencies. And I don't know. Um, how about yourself? What do you what do you feel? Well, do you think it's going yeah, to? I, I think I mean, I, I agree. And, and some of my talking points were the same. I think just like in any business, right, you have certain let's go to you're in the restaurant business. Right. So let's say the restaurant, certain restaurants are constantly upgrading they're setting, they're keeping up to date with the look of the restaurant, the technology and everything else. And then other ones you see on some of these kitchen nightmare shows where they don't ever put any money back into the business and it eventually collapses because it's it's outdated stuff. So outdated equipment in Bitcoin mining is going to be not become profitable once this halving happens. So I think a lot of those miners are going to just shut their equipment off. Hmm. Whereas others have gotten ahead of the curve and they've purchased the newer equipment, they've upgraded, they realize there's a cost of doing business. And so we're going to see uh, maybe some hash hash, pay, uh, hash rate shift. I think initially we, we're going to see a drop, 
but then it's going to pick back up uh, rapidly um, in, in the hash rate. Now, no matter what, the transactions on the blockchain are still going to be very secure. I mean, we're talking, they're still going to have a huge force that's working within the, the blockchain. But I think um, I think that's what's going to happen uh, with the mining. And, and, and as far as electricity goes, there's got to be a cost barrier um, or else everybody would mine, right? So if, if, so, you know, in Satoshi's case, he or she utilized proof of work, whereas there's an electrical investment to do that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of options, right? There's hydropower, there's wind power, there's solar power. So I think we're going to see a lot more green mining farms come online, whether they're mm-hmm. mining Bitcoin or other proof of work currencies. So mm-hmm. I think we're going to continue to see proof of work and proof of stake is going to also continue to thrive. There's two different secure methods. I Honestly, I like both of them depending on what's happening. Now, your proof of stake can, can be a lot more nimble and a lot faster. So you're going to see a blend of both um, when it comes to it, because uh, I think cryptocurrency, we're used to seeing currency divided by borders, right? And all borders are man-made lines. They're just imaginary lines that man made up and I dictate certain currencies. But I think with cryptocurrency, you're going to see it. It's it's also going to migrate to sectors, but it's going to be in industrial sectors where certain currencies may be used for different things. And mm-hmm. you're going to continue to see proof of work, proof of stake continue to, to happen. But I really feel that mining is always going to be around, but there are going to be ways to make it more efficient. And no matter how, how um, energy wasteful people may think Bitcoin mining is, it's, it uses a lot less electricity than the cost of operating current financial institu- institutions, minting coins, printing dollars, and all of that, and just keeping all these banks open, which, mm-hmm. I mean, let's face it, do you need a building as a bank when all of that can be utilized as an app on your phone, right? Mm-hmm. So all of these bank uh, physical locations are not necessary in, anymore in the near future. I think you're right. I think, you know, whoever Satoshi is and whoever started all this, um, and whatever their intention was, it did bring about decentralization. It did bring about cryptocurrencies and, and basically solve the double spending problem that we have. And now we can have these digital currencies. And it had to start from, I mean, energy itself has to kind of be transferred, right? And uh, from, you know, we from Mother Earth, we've take, taken a lot of this energy and we've converted into other forms of energy. So, you know, that is the, the scarce resource that we have on this planet you know when we look at oil when we look at the natural resources and electricity it, it, there is a cost to it and that is like the natural cost that you know the natural resource that we're using to get the electricity but then once that energy is converted and then it's we've got this um thing called bitcoin now and we have this network that has given rise to a lot of these cryptocurrencies now and all these projects that are built upon uh, the Bitcoin white paper, looking at the Bitcoin white paper, and now we can move on to a, a better ways of securing a blockchain and and proof it, proving that these transactions have taken place. But originally, there had to be something like a mothership, something that we can all kind of base our ideas upon and improve upon, and that is Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, so it had to start from something, and as we move forward into the future, when we actually change the world, and we are going to change the world for the better when, you know, like you say, we know we don't need these big banks and we can do it with a mobile phone. We have to be conscious of the environment and the planet we live in. Like, for example, with the with the with the current lockdowns across the globe, um, the, the whole planet had, had took a breather, you know, and if we it just shows that we can do it if we want to. Um, we just don't see it that important. That's the problem. So you know it's kind of a bit you know it's a bit weird because you're you're thinking about your own health like i'm gonna get this virus i may die like millions of people may die and now you're in lockdown but what about the planet you know it's like if we can actually um every five years or every two years we can take like a month or two and just kind of step back from using a car and start using a bike instead and think about the planet we can actually solve a lot of problems. So it's all about intention. And this movement with cryptocurrencies is going to change a lot of things. Banking, you know, is going to change. Finance, not only finance, so a lot of industries are going to change how they work. Uh, but it's we have to 
when we create these new industries and new uh, ways of working, we have to think about the environment. We have to think about the future generations and how they're going to live their lives. And then when, when we go like two or three generations ahead and look back at the history of how Bitcoin and the, the, how the financial institutions, everything changed and how cryptocurrencies came in, and what it did for people when it comes to finance and and the way that we work with say supply chain and everything else we're we're actually going to look at it in a positive way i feel that it was worth it you know yeah. or using these resources and everything um it all depends on how we actually use technology you know how we use blockchain to actually justify the use of all this electricity and everything else yeah absolutely you know um and you know back to the question and Bill asked earlier about what we see blockchain adoption in our lifetime. I've been saying, and I know you feel the same way, that it's important for us to learn about cryptocurrency and blockchain and all the implications. Um, currency is just one application on the blockchain, uh, but it's evolving into such a different thing that's going to uh, revolutionize so many different categories. But our kids, our kids and their kids, it's going to be vital for them because that's the world they're going to live in completely. We're dealing yeah. with, we're going to deal with technologies side by side, old and new, right? Old currency models, new currency models, old non blockchain structures, decentralized blockchain structures. They're going to get to a point where they're going to see that's going to be their life, right? So it's, it's important that we teach kids too, and don't leave them out of the discussion when it comes to this, mm. because that that's where you're going to really see, um you know the adoption take place um you know with all of this so um yeah like you say we have to think beyond currency you know yeah. bitcoin as a currency is just one application of the blockchain and if we look at like uh the covid19 apps that are coming out now to actually track if somebody's got the virus you know these are centralized you know all yeah. this data being collected and these are real issues that re people are talking about but we have the technology to improve upon that. We can have decentralized applications to do exactly that, you know, collect people's data, but do it in a way that their data cannot be hacked. Yeah. Um, so it's not privacy. Yeah. And I think the problem is people are not speaking up around data. They're not saying like, you know, I don't want my data to be stored on a central server because they don't know there is an alternative and they don't know the, the the result the, you know what could actually happen if it gets hacked even though we, we so many systems did get hacked in the past i don't think people realize how important your privacy and your data is and i think our kids their kids will will value privacy much much more than us and they'll look back at us and 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 the way we use our laptops and phones and think we're stupid you know like how how did you use your phone and a laptop in this way on a, on that kind of server and you know these routers that can you know it's like they, they won't understand they'll, they'll think are oh, ridiculous how could you even do that all that and they'll probably have to go back in time uh to secure their own privacy like you know go back a few generations to, to make sure that their data is secure you know so they'll probably have to it's like us you know realizing that our parents and our grandparents in the 80s and the 70s and the 60s were really careless about the privacy of their data which is now having an effect on us so we now have to kind of go back and look at systems and make sure that we're not our, our own data is not in the wrong hands and we can do that now because of technology and we can go back and make sure that our grandparents data and our parents data and everything is secure they will probably do that for us you know because we're so careless about our data and our privacy but there will be a time when privacy becomes so important and by that time uh, currencies like uh, zcash and all, uh, all this technology that's basically um cutting edge technology but so early is going to be very important as like a foundation layer of creating a better system money system a more private way of working yeah. um, and then it comes to like it's not only currency on the blockchain it's everything you know it's like well not everything's going to need a blockchain but a lot of things will um and i think we're heading towards that especially with the way social distancing and all this is coming into place i think it's going to change how people think and how people 
um, trust. There is yeah. a need for a trustless way of working, you know? Yeah. Well, I can say this, man. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there uh, oh, yeah. today. And you've really got to think that there's extreme acceptance of what we're being told. There's extreme conspiracy theories saying the opposite. But I think most of the people realize the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm. But it's also waking people up to the fact that you you can't always trust um, those that are in power right now, whether it be financial institutions, government institutions, mainstream media. Um, there's some control and trust issues there. And blockchain and decentralization can help solve some of those issues as these technologies evolve. Um, I think so, we're going to go. Sorry, Wayne. I think oh, we're going to go say, full, full circle with yeah. technology. But carry, carry on. Just say, finish what you're saying. Sorry. Oh no, I was actually about to say we've hit the 40 minute mark. I don't know if you want to have any any final words as we wrap up this discussion. Obviously, we came here to talk about the halving, but you can't talk about the halving without talking about all the other implications of blockchain and Bitcoin and crypto and you know, unless you're you're running a mining pool, you know, we didn't get too much into the technicals of, of mining and all that, but we discussed what the halving is. So any final thoughts for any for everybody below? Um, I think, you know, my, my final message would be, you know, the, these are interesting times. We, we're basically at a very um, important, obviously, it's like a very depressing year for a lot of us, but it's an important point in the history of bitcoin in 2020 and the next halving is going to be 2024 um that's four years away but in the these four years so much is going to happen um and we all have to make sure that whatever happens happens for the good of humanity and and benefits everyone and rather than kind of destroy everyone and i think what we're going to head towards in the, this decade is technology becoming um more and more available for the billions of people out there and uh we're going to kind of take more things for granted just like the last decade or so we, we we started getting um you know internet was like taken for granted mobile phones smartphones are taken for granted and that's like we can't live without the internet now in the next 10 years the next decade you will start taking blockchain for granted AI for granted, VR technology for granted, all these technologies. And one thing we're going to have to realize is we need to hold on to our values and our own kind of mind, to be honest, because whoever controls technology controls the world now. You know, the new oligarchs of the world are basically not businessmen, not politicians, but the tech CEOs. Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, these type of people, right? So the power shift has taken place already. Um, it's just a matter of time before we actually realize that the new president is Mark Zuckerberg or someone like that. You know, not Mark Zuckerberg, but maybe somebody from the tech space would start entering politics and it can happen um, because they are very influential, powerful people now. So what we have to be aware of is things like CRISPR, you know things like um smart technologies like you know having microchips implanted into you and a gene a gene um you know like when you when you people are messing around with um genes you know like crispr and um, that kind of technology actually is already being ex experimented with you know um and people like mark zuckerberg have their hands in it you know they they're basically experimenting with it for the greater good but these people, even though it seems like they are doing great things and all the, all this conspiracy kind of at the moment is coming around like Bill Gates and the coronavirus and all this, they need to still be held accountable and they still need to, they are still businesses. And what we need to do is be more educated around this cutting edge technologies and make sure that whatever technology comes into, into play in the near future, is for the greater good of humans. And, and one way of doing that is making sure that too much control does not go to one company or one person. And that again, goes back to decentralization. So we can actually work with technology to make the world a better place. But I think it's very dangerous 
no matter how good that, that technology is and how many benefits that technology may have to actually give that technology to one company or one person or one country it needs to be there needs to be some kind of democracy as we move forward because the 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 pro problem with giving that so much power to one country um we're, we're already seeing you know a lot of uh, things that are happening right now um you know blaming china and blaming this you know we really don't know the full picture and we will never know but if there is some kind of consensus and if there is some kind of voting that can start going into how we work as, a, as an economy how we work with politicians voting everything you know and that's what we need to push and the only way we're going to push that is actually understanding it the basics first and your curiosity may may be may start from this halving you know so i would encourage you to learn about the halving how bitcoin works understand decentralization because we don't know who we have in this community and you should never doubt yourself you should always think that you can make a change on this planet you you may you may actually do something really powerful something really amazing for the greater you know for the world basically but you have to learn you have to educate yourself you have to find what actually um is your power your superpower um, yeah. and one way of doing it is learning tech all right so that's that's my final message to the community and uh enjoy the halving yeah i shared a funny message here with uh Yanos, uh, who's in our Blockchain Training Academy group, Yanos commented, my little girl has just asked, why is Bitcoin broken in half? And if you saw me kind of chuckle while Bilal was talking, that's what I was laughing at. I wasn't laughing at, at his comments. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's something you got to explain to people about the halving. It's just the mining rewards. And I'll tell you, it's not just kids um, because something that the other day, I, I saw someone had posted on their Facebook page, Oh my God, Bitcoin is splitting in a few days. Make sure to buy some now. Yeah. And I had to comment on it, uh, you know, because I had to let people know that's not how it is. And people that are used to investing in like traditional stock markets, it's not like that. A halving doesn't mean it's going to split and you get a two for one split. Uh, it means all it means is the mining reward that the miners get for security and network is getting cut in half, which lessens the supply. And a lot of people like to point to the stock to supply ratio and how that could what that could mean for Bitcoin price in, in the, you know, in the next, you know, short term and also in the long term. Uh, but I had to share that comment from from Yano about his, his daughter. So, yeah, good luck explaining that one. Let us know how you how you explain that. Um, as far as we got another question asking if we're going live for the halving and. Um, you know, Bilal, we, we talked about it. Um, there's a, a discrepancy among the different ones of us to around when that's going to be, but we will be doing something around that time. So uh, anything you want to say on that, Bilal? Yeah, it's, I think it's around 2.30 in the morning, so I'll try my best. But if anybody wants to uh, join us and get into the conversation just like this one, like if you had something to say and you'd love to be here with us, we can make an event of it, and uh, it would be nice, nice to uh, get together on this momentous uh, moment in history yeah. yeah we'll bring some more people on and just talk crypto you know and if you want to join we'll post the link and you can hop in as well uh so yeah about 2 30 uh, a.m uk time it's going to be about what i think we figured about 8 30 or 9 30 uh here in the uh p.m in the u.s so it's going to be monday morning for you it'll be sunday evening for those in the u.s and just check your time zone to see when it is you see right here in the screen i'm sharing right underneath the countdown it says it's going to be at around basically zero hours and 21 minutes UTC time, which you're like, what, an hour or two behind UTC time in the UK? Yeah, an hour. Yeah. So they're saying around 1.21 a.m. for you. Yeah. But that's just my like, answer. like my answer said this happened sooner, so I guess we'll see who's right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not going to be anything that you... There's no fireworks that are going to go off outside your house or anything like that. So you really won't know uh, that halving's actually taken place. But, you know, it'll be nice to kind of even go onto a block explorer and see that block and, you know, start looking at, um, you know... I th I th I'll, I'll try to be here and uh, I'll do my best. But if anybody wants to join us, just message me or Wayne. 
um, and uh, we can share, we can communicate and make sure that we're on at the same time. That's it for today's episode. I want to thank you for listening, and we will catch you on the next episode.